Okay, so this is the first um, learning outcome for the general and special senses chapter. I'm dividing this chapter into two uh, lectures. So we're going to be covering general senses on the first lecture and then special senses on the second lecture. So for this learning outcome, we're going to be talking about receptors, sensory coding, tonic receptor, and phasic receptor. So before we get to it, I think it's important for us to differentiate what um, sensation is from what a perception is. So initially, we have information is going to be received or picked up by uh, sensory receptors. And these sensory receptors, they're going to take this information to the central nervous system. So the fact that they're taking the information to the central nervous system is called a sensation. But when you actually feel the sensation, so you're aware of the sensation, then it's called perception. Okay, so just because you have a sensation doesn't mean that you're conscious about it. Doesn't mean that you're aware of this sensation. Only when it's perception, that's when it means that you're conscious of this sensation. So you're aware that it exists. Now, like I said, we can divide the senses into general senses and special senses. General sense, or actually it's better to start with special senses. So special senses has to do with um, things like smell, taste, balance, hearing, and vision. And these are going to re involve uh, special, what we call special sensory receptors that are going to be located in uh, these complex sense, sense organs like your eyes, your ears, and your taste buds. And um, in the case of smell, it's going to be located in your nose. Okay, so these are um, special senses. And everything else is what we call general senses. So these are going to detect things like temperature, pain, touch, pressure, vibration, and uh, proprioception. And these are going to, therefore, arrive in the primary sensory cortex. So you guys should remember that if we have a brain here, we're, I know, right, a horrible brain. So this will be frontal, and this would be occipital, and right down the line you have your central sulcus. So this area over here is going to be your primary sensory cortex, right? Right posterior to your central sulcus. So when we're talking about general senses, we're talking about information that's arriving right over here at the primary sensory cortex. When we're talking about set, uh, special senses, we're talking about them, for example, if we're talking about visual, we're talking about information that's going to arrive specifically in your either called visual cortex or your occipital lobe. If you're talking about taste, then we're talking about your uh, information that's going to be arrived in specific areas of your brain that um, I won't be able to draw over here, but um, let's stick with the vision or we can stick with um, the smell, right? Because we know the smell will be right over here in the front of your cerebrum, okay? With regards to receptors, we know that um, receptors, we have several different types of receptors. These receptors are going to uh, be responsible for characteristic uh, sensitivity. And this all has to do with where the information is going to arrive in your central nervous system. We have a variety of um, different types of receptors. The most simplest one is what we see over here on this figure. It's called the free nerve ending. And it's going to respond to a variety of stimuli. And again, the reason we're able to differentiate this variety of stimuli is where the end point of the stimuli is going to be. We can have more complex types of receptors like the ones we have on the retina that are going to be very specific and will only respond to light. So 
uh, again, a, a wide variety of receptors. When we're talking about receptive fields, we're talking about how we're able to differentiate a sensation that's coming from a similar location. So if we have a very large receptive field, so for example, you can see how this free nerve ending here has this receptive field number one and a receptive field number two. And this receptive field, I would say that it's pretty broad, right? So it's pretty large. So the larger the receptive fields, so the further apart they are, it's going to make it more difficult for you to localize a stimulus. Because if it's you have a receptive field or a stimulus occurring over here, and since this uh, receptor localizes this all of this field, you're not sure if the stimulus is coming from this point or if it's coming from this point. Now the smaller the receptive fields, so the closer they are to each other, it's going to make it easier for you to localize the stimulus. Okay, so if you had one little stimulus like we have, for example, this one right over here. So this one, your um, receptive field is very small and you're able to pinpoint exactly where the stimulus is coming from. Okay, so again, the larger the receptive field, so the further apart the receptors are and are able to spread apart from each other, it's more difficult for you to localize the stimulus. The smaller the receptive fields, they're going to have receptors that are going to be closer to each other. This is going to make it easier for you to localize the stimulus. Okay, so that's when we talk about receptive fields. So when we're talking about um, sensory coding, basically we're talking about uh, interpretation of sensory information. So how we're able to decodify the information that's going to be coming in. So as we know, the information is going to be relayed from a specific receptor to a specific neuron on the central nervous system. Now each pathway is going to carry information that's going to be concerning a specific sensation, right? So remember, pathway carries information to a specific area and therefore it's going to create a specific sensation. Now the identity of these active neurons are going to indicate either the location of the stimulus or the nature of the stimulus. Okay, and this sensory coding is basically going to provide information about the strength, the duration, the variation, and the movement of the stimulus. Okay, so it all depends on location and nature of stimulus, where the information is going to be received, and where the information is going to go to. Now we can classify these receptors into three types basically two types and then we put one together. But the first type of classification is what we call tonic receptor. The second one is what we call a phasic receptor. The third one is when we combine both. Now the tonic receptor, it's a receptor that's always going to be active. So for example, the photoreceptors of your eyes are always going to be um, active receptors that are uh, constantly monitoring our body position are always going to be active. So these are tonic receptors. Now the phasic receptors, basically they're usually inactive and when it needs to be stimulated, they're going to be active for usually short periods of time. Okay, so they're not always active like the tonic receptors. So phasic for a phase, so that means for that they're going to be active for a short period of time. So for example, if you have touch and pressure receptors that we use a lot uh, of the times as example, these are going to be uh, a phasic receptor. So when you touch something, it stimulates and you can feel it. But um, I don't know if you notice this, but sometimes when you touch somebody and the initial fact that you're touching somebody or let's do it the other way around. If somebody touches you for the first time, you sort of feel that touch right away. 
But if the person maintains their hand on top of yours without moving or doing any other stimulus, you sort of forget that that stimulus is there. Okay, so that's the phasic type of receptor, that it's active for a short period of time. And the last one, when you combine both the tonic and the phasic receptors, this is, uh, gives you a very complicated type of input and um, stimulus. And basically, this is done by your proprioceptors, which is telling you where you are in space and time. Okay, so these are the three examples of uh, main receptors. Um, with regards to um, central processing and adaptation, adaptation basically is going to be a reduction in the sensitivity due to a constant stimulus. So if you're stimulating something um, for several periods of time, then um, basically you adapt to that stimulus and you stop responding to that stimulus. When we're talking about peripheral sensory adaptation, we're also talking about an adaptation to the stimulus, but basically because um, your axons become tired of firing that same signal. So we call it a synaptic fatigue. So after a while, your body stops responding to that stimulus that's coming from the periphery, basically because your axons become very fatigued and tired and therefore they stop sending that type of stimulus. Now this response is usually very characteristic of the phasic receptors that we talked on the previous slide and therefore they also receive the name of fast adapting receptors. So your phasic receptors can also be called the fast adapting receptors. Now the tonic receptors, they usually show very little peripheral adaptation and therefore they're called slow adapting receptors. Now the next type of process is what we call central adaptation and basically this is when your central nervous system adapts to the stimulus. So you're going to have uh, be consciously aware of the stimulus but then it's sort of quickly uh, disappears because um, your brain doesn't really want to be um, being stimulated by an information that it's not very important. Okay, so remember when we talked about the movie Lucy where we only use about 1% of our brain capacity? That's because we sort of erase stimulus that um, are not important for us at that particular time. And so this is what we call the central adaptation. And central, like the name says, it's done at the level of the central nervous system. And peripheral is done at the level of the peripheral nervous system. Okay? So this is um, our last slide for this part of the lecture.